My, my, hello, everyone. We are very excited to be here. My name is Pavel, and this is Matt. And uh, we are here today to, to share with you a, a, a case study, our, our story of how we, how we implemented more than uh, half of the CNCF incubated projects over the past uh, two years, a little more than two years. Cool, cool. Um, so we're both engineers at Fairfax Media. Now, Fairfax Media has just recently merged in uh, with another company in Australia called Nine. So we're now one of the largest media organisations in Australia. Um, Fairfax Media itself is a bit over 180 years old. Um, we focused largely on print media, so that's your newspapers. And these days, you may have noticed everyone's looking at your blogs, your mediums, uh, sites like that. So they're the kind of people that we're competing against in this day and age. And um, just, just to give you some, some perspective of what we are working on, we are working on a huge publishing pipeline that basically receives news from various uh, content management systems, news feeds, and then pushes this to uh, print media, mobile applications, and some of the um, most popular news websites in Australia. And just to, to um, note something here, a, a regular website that has millions of users usually focuses on, on reliability. You want your website to always be available, OK? And if you, res if you achieve that, you're all good. But we, we need to get one step further. We not only need to be highly available, we can't afford to be stale because we are serving news, OK? So we can't ever afford to have like a stale website because that's no longer news. So not only we need to be highly available, but we need to always, always update our websites as soon as possible. So you might be um, asking, how is this talk related to you? So if, if you're here in this conference, Obviously, you're in, interested in, in the CNCF uh, hosted projects, uh, namely Kubernetes and, and all the ecosystem around it. And regardless of um, whether you're considering uh, starting a transformation or you are already um, into it, um, I, will, I will try to, uh, and, and Matt and I will try to share uh, uh, some of the steps of, of our journey. And, uh, We'll present our journey as, as a group of islands that, that we visited. OK, we'll try to, to tell a little bit of story here. And maybe, maybe some of the islands that you have visited or you will visit will be different. Maybe you'll find some intersection points. But the main idea is that you know, we share um, um, our experience. Obviously, every single island deserves its own talk. So this will be a high level uh, case study. It's kind of overview uh, thing. But, uh, Hopefully, you, we'll be able to give you some kind of some some good um, points of view and and, uh, and important takeaways. So the first island is the planning island. So, why is all of this relevant? Why do we actually talking about our transformation? We got very, very lucky. We got the opportunity to do basically a whole of business reboot. We got to address and look at what the, everything we were doing from the top down. And this is not just technology. So we were given the opportunity to do a greenfield deployment inside an 180-year-old company. This is not an opportunity, obviously, that comes up very often. And we, had the, we really were able to just grab it with both hands. And fortunately for us, it was a whole of business. It wasn't just the technology, it was also the business drivers, the editorial teams, and a number of other components. Everything sort of really gelled together and gave us this wonderful, wonderful chance. To um, steal a phrase from a colleague, we were given the opportunity to disrupt ourselves. Media these days is hard. If you're talking about a very, very old legacy print company, you're against all the new media. So it was really a good opportunity for us to take this on. Yep, so really the key focus for our talk today though is just on the, uh, what's the keyword I used? The cloud native 
transformation that we've taken. And this leads us to the Inception Island, where our journey actually begins. So very, very early on, we needed stability. Although this was a greenfields deployment, we had other teams that were sitting on top of our infrastructure. We had development, we had editorial staff. Our, production, our clusters needed to be stable, rock solid from pretty much day one. But we didn't know everything. And this takes us to the unknown island, okay? So with uh, basically nobody in our team had any prior experience with Kubernetes at enterprise scale. Okay, so it's one thing to go to the getting started, maybe build some proof of concept, but supporting something at enterprise scale with literally, you know, a lot of load from the beginning, that, that is not a trivial job. And usually when, when you start working with a, with a new system, obviously you'll try to learn about it, you'll try to read about it, and everything that you don't know, you'll try to find find about it and read about it and, and test it. However, there are a lot of unknown unknowns. This slide is about the unknown unknowns, okay? So in our team, as, as, as Matt said, we were going through multiple transformations at the same time. We had only, uh, only one developer with prior Golang experience and everything we have is written in Golang. We didn't have, a, uh, we had only two developers with prior experience in microservices and um, we, claim to, to have a microservice infrastructure. And you know, we were learning many things on the go and we had very tight deadlines. That's a typical business situation. We didn't have time, hey, we'll stop doing our business as usual and we'll learn these new technologies. We were actually trying to, to uh, learn on the fly. And uh, with unknown unknowns, the thing is you only know that you don't know these things when you fail, okay? And w one example that I can give for this thing is uh, maybe setting your resource requests and limits for, for your pods in Kubernetes. So in the documentation, you will see that these things are usually optional. However, if you, when, when you try to deploy something in production and you want it to be reliable, you absolutely must set resources, uh, requests and limits for your pod. And, and, and that's, that's extremely, extremely important uh, if you want to ensure um, uh, good reliability and scalability. And that leads to the next island, which is the, the prepar preparation island. So, we, initially we had to spend a lot of time making sure that our environments were standard, consistent, redeployable, repeatable, a similar pattern. This is important for you know, operations, it's important for developers. It means you can take one set of skills for one thing and just directly apply it to another. There's no crazy differences all around the place. One of the things we did find that actually worked out quite well for us was in Kubernetes, we were actually using a very large number of namespaces. One of the common patterns I've seen in a lot of other tutorials is having very small number of namespaces with lots of things in them. We've gone the other way and that's actually paid off quite well for us. We've got lots and lots of small little namespaces and using things like namespace annotations we've been able to enrich and more easily manage our infrastructure. And this takes us to, in my opinion, the most, the most important slide of, of, of <laughs> this whole thing and that is the skeptic island, okay? So I, I can't stress this enough, no is temporary, yes is forever, kind of forever. So what I mean by this is you have to be extremely skeptical when you introduce new technology into your production stack, right? You, of course, by all means, there are so many good projects in the Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, but initially, we, we resisted introducing serverless, we introduced, resisted in, introducing um, uh, service mesh and a few other things because they're under heavy development. If you introduce them early in your, and, and I'm talking about two, two years ago, okay? So if you introduce these things into your stack early, maybe you're solving one problem, but what you're actually doing, you're not solving a problem, you're introducing more complexity. You install it once, however, you maintain this forever. So think about the maintain, maintenance afterwards. You have to update versions, this will interact with your other components, this sets restrictions on your further development. 
So when you introduce new, new technology, new component into your infrastructure, think about the consequences. And only ever install something and introduce something into your production stack if you absolutely must, if, if there is absolutely no other way of, of solving the problems. So probably, um, I, think I, saw this, I think I saw this title somewhere in, in Twitter about pull request merging. It can be applied to many things, but think about the consequences. Maybe you have a problem, it's very easy to just install something that solves the problem all good and then you know, some, it's somebody else's problem. However, think about maintenance, think about the, uh, what happens next. And then, next step of our journey is the secret island. Okay, we, like, you have some general idea, you want to go through this massive transformation and install your application in your Kubernetes clusters. And then you have this secret island. It doesn't matter what type of business you have and what type of applications you have, you need secrets. Your applications need to interact with some kind of secrets. It doesn't matter if it is database connection strings, tokens, certificates, you name it, you need some kind of secrets. Make sure that your first Hello World application actually works with secrets from day one. I can't stress this enough and try to, try to add secrets, revoke secrets, rotate secrets, and if it all works then, and only then, you can proceed with your development. This is something that you can't leave for day two, you can't do later. This is something that you need to do from the very beginning. There are plenty of projects in the ecosystem, I don't want to name them and, and miss someone, but this is something that, uh, for some people, it's, it's a known unknown. They leave for later and then, then they regret. Which. Speaking about security, it takes us to the next island, which is the Forbidden Island. And also thinking about things that will bite you if you don't think about it from day one. Credentials, um, access control, RBAC, and that kind of things. It is very, very difficult to just have a cluster that was built with no access control set up at all, and then try and turn access control on. If you want to you know, imagine it, well, just take my word for it. We've been bitten before. It's a nightmare. It's, it is horrible. Ask him how he knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these kind of things require a lot of planning. They require a lot of preparation. And you've got to really think quite hard about how to provide the right levels of access control. You've got operations engineers who might need to do X. You've got developers who might need to do Y you need to provide the right levels so people can do their jobs so you're not getting in the way. One of the things we found is quite useful for that kind of tooling is things like chatbots. You can provide an auditable control point to be able to do certain tasks and not have to, say, give somebody full API access, which sometimes is good, sometimes is bad. Then this takes us to two very close islands. We just named them North Observability and South Observability because they're very closely related, but they're different. So observability is very important. Knowing what's happening in your cluster with your applications, knowing what's going on is very important. Knowing when your site's down, why it's down, very, very important things. And there's lots of very good talks. There's lots of really good papers and things out there. These are some of the tools that we've been using that have been incredible. Um, these are tools that we've spent a lot of time either uh, using, developing, submitting back to. Things to keep in mind though is there's lots and lots of different things you might need to collect. Lots of different metrics. You need to collect data about your infrastructure, obviously, but collect everything because you never know when you might use it. One of the things that we do in our office now is we've actually got dashboards and status screens absolutely everywhere. One of the things that's really useful is we've actually got a status screen showing our current costs, so our costs day by day. So when there's something that goes hinky, we can see that very quickly. One of the other really big benefits in that space is we've got a wall size screen in the office that just shows our error rates across the websites. And people notice when we get spikes now, you know, HTTP errors. And people ask, why did that rate right jump? Why is there a problem? And then they'll go and dig into it themselves. And that's not just the operations engineers who might be tasked looking that day and day. It might be development teams, project managers, or other people. So having that visibility is really, really key and really awesome. 
And this takes us to the neighbor island, which is again about observability. However, on the application side of things, obviously once you set, set up your infrastructure, logging, tracing, metrics, alerting, and, and all the other bits and pieces next to it and, and, and graphs, you want to make sure that your applications actually use it. Because in what I've seen from my experience, a lot of developers are rushing the features to production without spending enough time on observability. Okay? And what I mean by this, you obviously have some kind of applications. And these applications are doing something, otherwise you wouldn't have them. So just measure how often this thing happens, how much time it takes how many messages or requests you're receiving, or I don't know, maybe the, the input size or the output size. And just to give some examples, a lot of people are just using their system metrics, okay? Maybe requests per second. Let's just take this example. Is this a good metric? Maybe you have labels with a, a status code, if it is an HTTP request, like status code 200, status code 500, you have success, error rate. Is this good enough? Well, it's not. You might, you might have totally good set of only successful requests, but you need underlying business metrics. For, for example, for our business that's publishing an article, how many articles we have published in the past minute, hour, day, whatever. We might have only successful requests, but no, nothing gets published. Is this good? No. So you, you need to be able to cross-reference business processes, bus things that happen in your application. That's developer's responsibility. Also, in, in the tracing world, it's not enough to just have uh, distributed tracing in your system and, and say, hey, we're using open tracing, we're using uh, this and that system. You need to have spans for every single thing you use. For example, you need to, to add some kind of wrapper to your database driver. It doesn't matter what database is. You need spans for the databases. Or maybe your search system, or maybe your caching system, or third-party service. HTTP request or gRPC request, whatever thing you're doing, you need to add proper middlewares for all the drivers and all the cross-app references, including in-app processes, so that you can visualize every single request. And um, in addition to tracing, obviously you need logging. Your logging needs to be leveled. When you receive millions and millions of requests, at some point you, it, you get flooded by successful requests. You're only interested, let's say, in the error requests. So you need some kind of level. Obviously you need structured logging so that you can filter by service, by process, by you know, by job, and, and, and metrics. Yeah, you need metrics for everything, but that's developer's responsibility. Developers can't just say, hey, it's the DevOps problem. They need to add metrics. You have to add it in your, in your app. So then, with, with, with that being said, this brings us to the next, next island, which is the micro island, okay? Does your team speak microservices? Ours did not. Um, when, when we started, we had only one or two developers with prior experience in microservices. And, you know, this is, this, is very, this, is, this is again related to the unknown unknowns. You start doing something, maybe you read some articles, and what most people think, and that's very wrong, what most people think is that they have this, this monolith, this existing system, and, and many people, when they hear micro, that's something small, so we will have to split it, okay? Divide and conquer. We'll split it into smaller parts, and everything will be good. That's, that, that's really, really wrong. Because if you have an existing system with a problem and you split it in two, you have two systems with a problem. And then you further split it and you have, it just basically exponentially increase the systems with a problem. In a, micro, in a microservice architecture, ask yourself this question to check if you actually have that. You have a microservice, every, every microservice has its own database or some data source, maybe, maybe if, it is, it's, if it's stateful. Ask yourself this question, how do you get the current state of the world, like a snapshot of the world, from more than two services at the same time. And ensure reliability, you know, scalability. Think about data consistency. And it starts getting very interesting. The more features you add, it gets very interesting. And then how, how do you get alerted if something in that system doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So, with that being said, we have microservices and they need to talk to each other, okay? From day one, we went with a HTTP kind of restful architecture. Luckily, very, very quickly, like a few weeks later, we switched everything to gRPC, and that, that, 
that's paid off really, really well for us. Um, and um, HTTP was created for service to browser communication. And we have service to service communication. So that, that was a very key decision in our architecture and, and it allowed us to, to add a lot of useful middlewares, a lot of useful things and, and it, around, on, the, on top of that we are using Prometheus metrics, we are using uh, logging middlewares, we are using tracing middlewares and, and we have a lot faster um, ever, like always running connections and this, this has allowed us to, to, to scale to a lot of like a lot of requests per second to, to, to achieve scalability that we need for our type of business. So serialization and how your services communicate is very important. And then I get to my favorite slide, okay? When you start a new Greenfield project, okay, you have two options. Option number one, is to pick a microservice framework for your favorite programming language. In our case, that's Golang, but that that's absolutely doesn't matter. You can pick any programming language you want. So one option you have is basically you can pick your favorite framework, or maybe the, most, the, the framework with the most stars in GitHub, and you can go with it. But remember our restrictions. We had to deliver features extremely fast. Most of the frameworks are kind of uh, agnostic about most of the technologies. You have a lot of things that you can tweak and adjust and configure, and that requires a lot of prior knowledge by a lot of people in the team. And we did not have this time. The other option that you have is basically have some kind of boilerplate, some kind of project that is already pre-configured, highly opinionated, and it, it has uh, you know, everything you need in order to start. So we decided to go with option number two. So we created a small application, and that small application had a leveled logger, it had appropriate health check and liveliness probe for, for Kubernetes. It had tracing. It had metrics. It had examples of how you add your infrastructure as code in, in your favorite cloud provider. It has a built CI CD pipeline. It had pretty much every single production ready feature you would want in, in, in an application. Okay? So, this way, every single one of the developers in our team could just copy paste this application, just fork this thing and start working on, on endpoints, on actual service logic without worrying of any of the other more complicated things. So we had people who are, for example, using open tracing without fully understanding how it works. We had people who are using metrics without fully understanding how it works. They didn't have to set up anything. They were using from day one proper logging with proper configuration, proper tracing with proper configuration, all the observability practices. That basically, they had examples that could co they could copy paste. So we were delivering features, and half of the team was not like fully understanding how the CNCF components worked, but they just worked. So mostly, this has uh, I think this has paid uh, paid off pretty well. We had one bad example, like we had one flaky unit test, and that required that we send hundreds of pull requests that you know fix this everywhere. So it, it wasn't all you know uh, smooth and perfect, but I think that that's one of the reasons that we managed to turn this project into 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 what we expected. Okay, this allowed us to upskill our team. As, there are other things that that Matt will mention later, but. That's something that, you know, this highly opinionated initial program allowed our teams that did not have prior experience in that programming language, did not have prior experience in, in such an architecture, did not have prior experience with, you know, Kubernetes and uh, uh, KubeCuttle or any of the tools that we use, didn't absolutely understand how Helm worked, and they were actually using it. So, that, that was a very, very fundamental decision for us. We ensured that we add examples for all the types of metrics with an actual expl explanation. If you have similar use case, use this type of metric. If you have this other use case, use the other type of metric. And then we actually had links to dashboards that visualize these metrics so that the developers could immediately see the result of de like deploying this to production with a chat chatbot command, basically forking the project, submitting some commit in a few minutes, and then you could see 
your project in production with the logging, with the tracing, with the metrics, with the alerts in Prometheus and, and all the things set up for them. And the only thing that they had to focus on was the business logic, the actual features that they deliver and those features were immediately available for other applications. It doesn't matter if it's mobile applications, websites, whatever we have, they were available to, 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 to consume. So it doesn't mean, look, your journey might be different, right? I'm talking how we started more than two years ago and with what we had at the time, with the restrictions that we had at the time, that was a very key decision for us. Maybe if you have a more experienced team or uh, you have a prior experience with microservices and you know what you're doing, okay, maybe you can go with some more, more um, uh, popular uh, microservice framework. However, we decided to go this way and we do not regret it, okay? This, this is something that, that has paid off. And um, with that being said, we had a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome in the team because like you, you get this huge existing team and you throw them at this new, new architecture, okay? And you tell them, this is what we do from now on. And then many people have questions, okay? And, and then we had to focus on knowledge sharing. How do we upskill the whole team in flight while we are delivering with extremely tight schedules, okay? We had very tight deadlines for all our features. And Matt will share a little bit about our knowledge island, how we managed to upskill our team in the context of the CNCF ecosystem, all the, the, the Kubernetes ecosystem and the projects around it. So one of the key things that was really useful was that openness that we had across the team. As part of this sort of greenfield, everyone was sort of almost brainwashed into this new world that we had. We had this new awesome solution and everyone really wanted to learn more about it. But you can't just, you know, suddenly become a Go developer overnight and write new microservice apps, unless maybe you have. So it's a lot of work to get there. So we've had a number of internal things. One of the things that I've um, found really, really useful internally is regular brown, brown bag sessions. And we're running brown bags internally across the whole division. We've got people who do product research who tell us about how they do their jobs. And in turn, we've got developers, we've got operations engineers, talking about what they do, how they do it, so everyone's got a better understanding. But it's also key, we've got people who specialize in, or we've got a lot of knowledge in our CI CD platforms, and they run workshops on how to better use it, caveats, you know, we've now got developers who independently decided, oh, I wanted to add a new component to the CI CD platform, and they've gone off and done it. Because we've got these skeletons, because we've got these other tools there, they don't need permission. They've just gone off, added it, and been able to take some real advantages of it. We've got things like our level up sessions, our internal training. You skipped on me. You go back one, please. I'm sorry. Just, just. So we've got our internal, internal training. We've got structured and unstructured training. And giving people that opportunity to learn, to play, to potentially learn and play in things that aren't their exact jobs, but they're sort of to the side, has been really beneficial in building stronger teams and understanding what the other guys are doing. Because if you understand, as an operations engineer, what the devs are doing, you can do your job better, they can do your job for you if you're really lucky, so you can sit back and reap the rewards of the devs doing all the work. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But we've got this, we've been pushing really hard for this DevOps culture. So in our environment, if the development teams build it, then they own it. If they break it, it's their job to fix it, largely speaking. Each of the development teams gets page duty or incident alarms and out of hours calls if their application fails, which is absolutely brilliant for me because I used to get woken up all night long from things that I couldn't do anything to control. Now, as an operations guy, I get alarms for things I can control, Development teams get the alarms for things that they can control. And you know, sometimes they might need help, sometimes they might need more assistance, and we can help with that. But that sort of culture of not just throwing something over the fence, sharing it, has been really beneficial. These kind of benefits 
have actually led into significant and measurable business type improvements. So nowadays, we were able to go, where are we? There we go. So our old application was a very big monolith, which had about a three week release cycle. So if you, your feature was running a little bit late, you'd potentially be waiting six weeks, nine weeks to get your new feature into production. We're a news company where we need to sometimes be able to turn around things much, much, much faster than that. And it just was not possible. So these days, we're actually releasing, I think the last count I saw for some of our stats, we're releasing up to 90 or 100 times every single day. We've got um, people that are working on applications. They release three or four times over the weekend just because they can. They would get their application out and fix something. So it's been really beneficial for us. But the culture has really changed. Because of that ownership, they feel more involved and things are actually significantly better as a result. And during, during this transformation, we have seen a significant growth in our, in our page views, in the, the number of subscribers that we get. And I think that partly this is due to, to the, 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 the fact that the CNCF transformation allowed our developers to focus on features, not not how we, they get the, the features deployed. They were actually focused on features all the time. In addition to that, they were more motivated. They were actually getting sometimes paid to work on open source project or they, they, were, they were working with, with things that are more exciting, more, more up to date. And if, like, let's be honest, everybody really likes working on things that are more modern. Nobody likes working on stale technology that's you know ancient. And what I want to mention is there is no such thing as I'm done with my Kubernetes deployment, okay? This is not a destination. Like I deployed everything and now what do we do? Like go home and you know, have some rest? It does, just doesn't happen. It is just an ongoing journey. So you still have to keep maintaining. You still have to keep taking care of the whole ecosystem. Versions change really, really quickly. Things change quickly. So you have to keep up to date. You have to update you know, take care of, of security updates. Maybe some of the things that you've implemented have already changed and have been standardized, or maybe some other project have been adopted or graduated the, 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 the CNCF ecosystem. So it, it is an ongoing process, and I think that uh, it's, it's a never, never ending journey. There are many things that we would like to improve in our system, and we're continuously spiking with, with all the, the CNCF project. I, I can say that we are definitely a CNCF driven company. We, like, all the things that we look at are, are, are around the, the Kubernetes ecosystem. And um, with that being said. So the question was around service mesh, Pav. No, nothing has changed our mind. We are not using service mesh yet, OK? So it's definitely something we are considering. We have had at. a lot of discussions. We have had a lot of people saying, hey, let's use service mesh for this, for that, for something else. And the answer so far has always been no. OK, let's wait a little bit more. Let's wait for stability, maturity, and so on. Uh, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently? Um, so the question was, you know, now that we've been through at least this stage of the journey, because it's not a destination, we're not at the end point yet, would we do anything differently? Um, hopefully not, to be honest. I think everything's gone really well for us. We've been really lucky. Uh, we've got great opportunities to do this. I mean, the opportunity to do a greenfield inside of a legacy company is not something that comes around very often. And honestly, everything we've, we've got has improved as a result. So we're doing pretty well, I think. Oh, sorry. You mentioned deadlines, and what was your timeline for this project? So uh, the question was, what was our timeline for this project? In, in general, we were rewriting multiple huge mastheads that we couldn't afford to go down. For, that's, that's a very difficult question, because for some projects, we had a deadline of, let's say, two months. For other projects, we, like, we had different deadlines by different teams within the organization. Some projects we just completely rewrote, and basically it was a DNS switch to the new one. For others, we were replacing section by section on the website and we were multiplexing some URLs to the new system, some to the old one. Um, 
in total, we managed to do everything from start to finish, basically, moving everything into Kubernetes within, I believe, less than a year and a half, like a year and four months. But we've spent on this like two years, so it, it keeps going. We're, we're constantly adding new things. There's still more to go, yeah. Sorry, I saw a question somewhere. Um, so the question was around sort of making sure that your skeleton, your, your projects or your work that's forked off your skeletons don't drift significantly, am I understanding correctly? Um, we were actually quite lucky because the teams themselves, there was a reasonably small number of developers that were actually working in concert. So instead of adding awesome new feature to the skeleton, they might add an awesome new feature to the skeleton, you know, from, sorry, for their project and then move that back up into the skeleton so other people got an advantage out of it. So there was still a high level of collaboration. Uh, a lot of our development teams were not isolated the same way some other teams might be. So it was all a very sort of communal effort. That's a very good question. Um, we are using some tooling around um, some, some other systems that actually update and manage Kubernetes secrets as native Kubernetes secrets. Uh, we've got a tool that helps us provide some um, auditing, tracking, and things like that. No, we, we're using a tool from Lyft. Any other, any other questions? Um, so, th so the question was around the, what was the size of it, the uh, relevant teams working on the project. Um, the teams actually grew over time. So initially the, the pure operations team was two to three people. Um, I wasn't around at that time, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it now. Um, there were, um, how many developers initially do you reckon? Initial, the initial team was 15 developers, I believe, and two people in the ops team, and now we have how many people? Uh, there's probably now we now we have few now we have two ops teams people all up and uh, more than more than sixty developers, seventy developers. I'm not exactly sure about the numbers. So, yeah, that, that's a very that's a very good question. I believe we're soon running out of time, but I'll try to answer. So the question was, how did we create our skeleton? Was it a template or was it something else? It was a very, very naive project that, that was just a hello world implementation with one HTTP handler and one gRPC handler, just the, the very, very minimal kind of thing. We were planning to create a command line tool that you just do like new service and then the name, it would generate everything for you. But for quite a lot of time, it was just fork and replace and you know just copy paste, yeah. This is how it started. Uh, maybe, maybe one last question. If anyone's got any questions? Over the side there. Uh, so you say you use um, largely only one Helm store. Do you see that as sort of like a sustainable model for the future of the uh, So the question was just um, basically standardizing on a single Helm chart. Uh, that's true. We, we do that, but that's largely for our internal applications, which all have a very similar pattern. So obviously we're using lots of different Helm charts when we pull in other applications from other sources. But the current, app, uh, current Helm chart we've written is very, very generic and open. So it's actually working out really well for us. In earlier days, we did have multiple different Helm charts. But centralizing more made our lives a lot, e a lot easier. Uh, I think that's about all the time we've got now, guys. If anyone else has any additional questions, you can come grab Pav or myself. Um, we're both available. <laughs> And, and we're both it, available on Kubernetes yeah. Slack, and there's a, there are a copy of the slides on the schedule if you need them. If you liked us, please give us positive feedback. Thank you.